Welcome to ASR's Managing Work at Height course. Now in this course, we will be teaching you how to work at height safely, how to supervise men working at height, how to manage and uh, implement systems, as well as to assess your own risks and uh, integrate all these um, various skills and functions together in order to um, produce a much safer working environment for your workforce. So in this section, we will identify, explain and apply relevant workplace safety and health legislations, approved code of practices, Singapore standards where applicable and various other work height regulations. Let's have a look at the Workplace Safety and Health Act because this is Singapore. So a lot of the things that we are dealing with are deals with our, our Singapore law. So the act is our law. As far as uh, workplace safety and health is concerned, this is uh, one of the key uh, regulations that we need to pay attention to. Now let's contextualize it to the work at height ecosystem and the WSH framework that we apply here in Singapore. There are three principles used in setting up this framework. It is to reduce risk at source by requiring all stakeholders to eliminate or minimize the risks that they create. Now that requires a mindset change from managing the risks to identifying and eliminating risks before they are created. So it's a much more proactive approach. It's no longer just prescriptive. Another principle is to promote greater industry ownership of WSH outcomes. So the key thing is outcomes. So we change from being um, just compliant to prescriptive rules. I say this, you do this, to a much more proactive um, stance whereby the uh, concept is to achieve better WSH outcomes. Preventing accidents through higher penalties for poor safety management. Of course, this is the rod nah, because accidents are costly, but we would like to, uh, the law would like to bring to your attention that actually poor safety management is costlier. Now, because this is the this is a work at height cost, it is uh, important for us to contextualize it within the work at height ecosystem. So in the work at height ecosystem, there are four main stakeholders. One is the worker, one is the supervisor, the assessor, and the manager. They form our work at height competency as well as legal framework. So how does these three principles apply? You know, we're looking at reducing risk at source, greater ownership, and preventing accidents through um, higher penalties, right? So for the work height manager, because his job deals with policies and systems, so his job is to develop and implement sound work height safety management systems, which will be in, supposed to be included in your fall prevention plan, as well as in your various permit to work systems, to ensure comprehensive risk assessments and effective implementation of control measures are done to eliminate or reduce the risk that comes with working at height. Now in uh, promoting greater industry ownership, his, uh, the manager's uh, role is to ensure that all these control measures are applicable to individual specific situation. So it cannot be just a blanket, you know, you know wear your safety harness, put on PP. It's not as simple as that. The keyword is uh, to ensure that accountability by putting a robust system in place and by setting forth clear policies dealing with work height. And preventing accidents through higher penalties because it is the manager's uh, role to ensure that this ecosystem is uh, in compliance to his policy and his systems. Uh. So all these control measures are to be complied with. For WAH assessor, how does this um, affect his, uh, his, his role? I mean, how, how, does this, how does this contextualize to the assessor? How does an assessor reduce risk at source by assessing whether all these hazards that were identified by this risk assessment team and that whether the control measures that are put in place are adequate as well as to verify the risk assessments of these work activities? And how does, uh, how does this promote greater industry ownership with WSH outcomes uh, link with the WAH assessor. So once again, the assessor, as the name, name uh, implies, that to assess that these control measures are in compliance indeed with the legislation guidelines or the approved code of practice. And how to prevent accidents through higher penalties and poor safety management, it is to assess whether the work activities conform with the permit to work, the safe work procedures and the method statements as well as various other um, like safety and health management systems or fall prevention plans that are put in place. 
So the assessor's role, as clearly indicated by his role, is called assessor. So he assesses, he or she assesses the work at high risk and hazards. The role of the work at high supervisor within this WSH framework, same right, three principles, reduce risk at source. So how do you reduce risk at source? You plan works in a way whereby the risk of four exposures are minimized, mitigated before the work starts. Being able to uh, note the hazardous uh, situations that you face while working at height uh, sometimes may be a little bit too late. So how do you promote greater industry ownership with WSH outcomes? Ensure compliance. A supervisor is the last line of management that is there to ensure compliance, enforce compliance. How do you prevent accidents through higher penalties and poor safety management? It is to exercise a last mile leadership. When we say last mile leadership, it is the, the very, um, where, the, where the metal meets the meat, where the rubber meets the road. You need to enforce safe work procedures and stop wrong behaviors immediately in order to prevent accidents. Now for a worker, you may think it's pretty straightforward, but it is not true. A worker has to plan work in a way whereby the risk of fall exposures are minimized and mitigated before the work starts. It sounds a little bit like uh, what the supervisor should do, but the supervisor is in effect uh, enforcing this particular action from the worker. All right, that's how you can reduce the work at uh, the risk at source for a warehouse worker because ultimately, the expert or the executor of any tasks for working at height is the worker. Uh, nobody works, work at height is not, an, uh, it's not a trade. There's no, so nobody works at height to work at height. You work at height to uh, conduct another uh, activity. It could be to install a window, it could be to clean something, it could be change light bulb, all kinds of things. So you work at height in order to do something. Nobody works at height to work at height. All right. So the work at height worker, the onus is on him or her to reduce the risk at source by planning his work, executing it according to the safe work procedure. How do you promote greater industry ownership? You comply and you watch out for your fellow workers. How do you prevent accidents through higher penalties uh, for poor safety management? Uh, report all unsafe conditions and exercise professionalism in your work. That is how a work at height worker is, um, is uh, what is what a work at height worker needs to do in order to fulfill the principles of this new WSH framework. So the WSH Act is, uh, you know, is, a, is a key legal instrument uh, to affect the principles of our OSH framework. It was administered by the Commissioner for Workplace Safety and Health came to force in 1st of March, 2006 and replaced the old factories at Chapter 104. It covers all workplaces and the cornerstone of this framework is risk assessment. The whole idea is that you need to identify and eliminate workplace risk. Now, this is a very logical and step-by-step um, -step approach to mitigating um, WSH and of course in detail, WAH risk, all right? The WSH Act covers quite a lot of things and it, it, rolled out, it rolled out in phases, but essentially, as of now, all workplaces are covered, including uh, education, business services, and public services. And in the Act, it also includes uh, government officers, persons working on behalf of the government, although not the government itself. So it's the duty of every person at work to use the regulation in such a manner so as to provide the protection intended um, for securing his own safety, health, and welfare while at work. He's also to cooperate with his employer or principal or any other person to such an extent so that everyone, okay, the employer, the principal, or any other person in this case, to comply with the provisions of this act. And no person at work shall willfully or recklessly interfere with or misuse any of these uh, appliances, whether PPE, whether protective clothing, conveniences, in order to, um, uh, to fulfill the requirements of this WSH Act. 
So any person uh, who without reasonable cause does any negligent act which endangers the health and safety of himself or others, you will be guilty of an offence. Uh, and you, shall be, you could be liable for a conviction uh, and a fine not exceeding $30,000 to imprisonment not exceeding two years or both. And any person who contravenes this shall be guilty or shall be liable to a conviction or fine not exceeding $1,000 or in a case of a second or subsequent conviction to a fine not exceeding $2,000. Now let's have a quick glance at the work height regulations. First, we must define work height. Work height means working on any place that's elevated where you could fall, in the vicinity of, vicinity of an opening where you could fall through, near an edge where you could fall, or through a surface. That means it could be like a fragile roof, a surface through which a person can fall, or any other place, whether above or below ground, from which a person could fall. So from one level to another, it's reasonably practicably likely that a person or any other person will be injured due to the distance of the fall. Now, this covers quite a lot of things. Lah. And essentially, it will also cover slip, trip and fall. It is irrelevant of height or depth. It is just essentially if you could fall, the word height definition could actually be applied to you. Now, this is to be distinguished between hazardous word height. Now, when we say hazardous word height, it means that there is something else within the regulations that define that says that perhaps a system needs to be in place in order to manage it. Now, this is an extremely sensible and logical way to demarcate certain um, responsibilities so that stakeholders can easily understand. Because once it is, um, let's look at this, huh? once the distance is more than three meters through which a person can fall, a hazardous, a hazardous work at height, uh, environment is, uh, is defined. Uh. What we are in effect saying is that once there's, once, once a where height task is considered hazardous, there is a permit to work system that is applied to it. It doesn't mean that uh, injuries, uh, accidents, and the law doesn't apply to anything below three meters. What it does mean is that above three meters, extra um, control measures such as the wet height ecosystem suddenly comes into play. So the focus of the wet height regulations is as such. Huh? First of all, you should avoid working at height. Huh? Then uh, you can't do that. Ensure that all openings and open sites are covered or barricaded. Use travel restraint systems first. And if that doesn't work, uh, use for arrest systems. Huh? So there's a tiered approach to how we should uh, look at wet height. Avoid working at height. It's the duty of a responsible person. It could mean the employer or the principal, who's a you know, employer is a, of a person who carries out the work in the workplace or the principal under whose direction a person carries out any work in the workplace. So employer is like your boss. Nah. But principal is like a subject matter expert for a particular task. Therefore, the principal is uh, responsible for various work at height risks, right? that is peculiar to his particular trade or tasks, right? It's the duty of uh, occupiers, you know, to implement a fall prevention plan. As long as uh, every workplace that is specified in the schedule in which work at height is carried out, a uh, fall prevention plan is required. And the fall prevention plan needs to be uh, established and implemented in accordance to the requirements of the approved code of practice. So there's a approved code of practice for working safely at height. In there, there are 10 elements upon which a fall prevention plan needs to cover. And it should be made available for inspection uh, on request by any inspector, which means that you need to have it. And uh, if you don't have it, you could be guilty of, a, of an offense and can be liable to conviction and a fine not exceeding $10,000. This regulation is uh, already enforced uh, since 2014. These are the workplace uh, listed in, uh, in the schedule that you are required to have a fall prevention plan. Any work site, any shipyard, any factory engage in uh, all these activities such as uh, processing or manufacturing of petroleum, petroleum products, petroleum uh, petrochemicals or petrochemical products. 
any premise where bulk storage of uh, toxic or flammable liquid is carried out on by way of trade or for the purpose of gain and which has a storage capacity of 5,000 or more cubic meters for such toxic or flammable liquid. Or any factory that is engaged in the manufacturing of uh, fluorine, chlorine, hydrogen, fluoride, carbon monoxide, or synthetic polymers. Any factory engaged in the manufacturing of pharmaceutical products or their intermediaries. Any factory engaged in the manufacturing of semiconductor wafers. Any factory not falling within any of the classes of workplace described in paragraphs one through seven, in which 50 or more persons are employed. Which means that, uh, you know, like these, uh, from item one to item seven, uh, they, you need to have a fall prevention plan. This is uh, clearly stated. If your workplace doesn't fall into the category of any of these seven, there's, a, there's, an, there's an extra point for you, which is if your workplace have more than 50 persons at work, 50 persons employed, you need to have a fall prevention plan according to our WSH Act. So the, for the implementation of the warehead regulations, uh, as, uh, as, as spoken earlier, this is the warehead competency framework where there's the worker, supervisor, assessor, and manager. So it is the duty of the responsible person to ensure that no person shall work at height until he has received adequate training. And he understands the nature of the four hazards and the control measures that are needed, which includes safe work procedures and the use of PPE. Now, this is a very big sentence. Huh? They, this will mean that it covers, uh, he has to know the risk, he has to know his job, and he has to know what, is, uh, what are the control measures, including like the PPE, how to use them, the fall protection equipment, how to use them effectively. This is all covered under the idea of uh, a person who is being properly trained and having received adequate training. So it is not enough for you to listen to a PowerPoint and then declare yourself as a competent to work at height. Supervision of work at height. It is a duty of a responsible person to ensure that no person shall work at height in a workplace except under the immediate supervision of a competent person. What this means is that when a supervisor wants a worker to work at height, he has to make sure he or she has to make sure that this uh, person is uh, this worker is supervised by a competent person. Now, a competent person here is going to mean that a person who is trained and experienced and um, able to carry out the task effectively. Okay, in the warehouse regulations, there's uh, something about the open sites and opening. It's the duty of an occupier that uh, every open site or opening into or through a person is liable to fall more than two meters, shall be covered or guarded by effective guardrails or barriers to prevent a fall. Now the cover or the guardrail barrier may be removed where free access is required to work actually in progress at or near the open site or opening. So TIGA openings or this are uh, here. Uh, every cover, guardrail or barrier shall be reinstalled and replaced immediately when the access of persons or movement of materials is not taking place at or near the open site or opening. So it is a very, uh, it, it wouldn't be right lah, to say, for example, you open up these uh, guardrails and barriers and then you stop and you go for lunch and then you're, it is left there alone for an hour. So if it's not in use, it needs to be closed, all right? So it is not reasonably practicable to comply for whatever reasons due to the equipment or the materials that need to be brought up to the, whichever floor, then a travel restraint system should be used, shall be used to prevent a person from falling into or through the open side. And where a travel restraint system is not applicable, a fall arrest system shall be used. Once again, you will see this very clearly. Use travel restraint first because travel restraint means you don't fall first. Fall arrest is like a backup. In case you do fall, you have something to catch you. That's how the law interprets this. Cover, guardrail, and barrier to prevent fall. You know, this regulation does not apply to any workplace in which any scaffold is being or is to be constructed, erected, installed, or used, repositioned, altered, maintained, repaired, or dismantled. All right. So what this means that uh, this particular regulation, right? You know, like for example, for scaffolders, for scaffold erectors, uh, they are constructing, erecting, installing, and repositioning all these guardrails. So 
their fall protection is could be active, could be safe work procedure. So it doesn't um, it doesn't make sense to apply this to them because they are the access providers. They are they are providing these covers, guardrails, and barriers. All right. So where a cover is provided in a workplace to prevent any person from falling, it shall be the duty of the occupier of the workplace to ensure that the cover is of good construction, sound material, and adequate strength to withstand the impact during the course of the work in the workplace. Now, this is uh, just a sensible thing to say, a sensible, sensible thing to do. If you, if you provide guardrails, it needs to be of good construction, well-made, sound material. You shouldn't be using materials that are not, um, not of the correct uh, specs huh? and adequate strength because otherwise it will be a false confidence to withstand the impact during the course of work. So if that is the kind of impact, you know, like uh, the law will state like whether in scaffolding 50 kg or in the uh, core practice for, for working safely, it has to be 100 kg for the guardrails. So it should be securely fixed in place to prevent accidental displacement straightforward, where any guardrail or barrier is provided in a workplace to prevent any person from falling, it shall be the duty of the occupier of the workplace to ensure that every guardrail or barrier is of good construction, sound material, and adequate strength. Once again, same thing, it needs to be properly made, material needs to be sound, and needs to be strong enough to withstand the force of a person pushing on it. So covers, guardrails, barriers to prevent fall. It is placed on the inside of the uprights of structure and secured so as to prevent accidental displacement. It is placed so as to prevent the fall of any person. And the top guardrail and the barrier is at least one meter above the work platform or working place from which any person is liable to fall, a vertical distance. And the vertical distance between any two adjacent guardrails provided between any work platform or workplace that the guardrail is and immediately above it does not exceed 600 millimeters. That means the distance between a top rail and a mid rail shouldn't exceed 600 millimeters. The idea is that a person shouldn't be able to fall through between the gaps of the top and mid rail or the guard rails. So travel restraint systems, to, it is the duty of any responsible person to ensure that this travel restraint system, same good construction, sound material, adequate strength, free from patent defects and suitable and safe for the purpose for which it's intended. And the person using the system is trained in the safe and correct use of this system. Now, travel restraint systems are active for uh, protection systems. They're active, they're, they're active systems because a worker has to actively play his part in managing this system in order to ensure that he or she doesn't reach and fall over the edge. So the law is saying that if you are using travel restraint systems, you need to understand how to use them. You need to make sure that this equipment is uh, safe and good for use. If you're using fall arrest systems, it is the duty of a responsible person to ensure that the fall arrest system is of good construction, sound material, adequate strength, free from patent defects and suitable and safe for the purpose which is intended for. The person who is using it should also be trained in the safe and correct use of the system and no part of the fall arrest system should come into contact with anything that could affect the safe use of the system. That would mean that if it is uh, meant to be taking a fall in a certain way, for example, not taking a over the edge fall because the equipment is meant to be taking a, taking a vertical fall, then you shouldn't be using a fall arrest system in that manner. Where four arrest systems are being used, a full body harness uh, shall be used. Like. And it's the duty of the responsible person to ensure that the system incorporates a suitable means of absorbing energy. Now, it means that a suitable system of absorbing energy and not just saying that it is an energy absorbing lanyard or an energy absorber. That means a system can be planned in such a way whereby it is, uh, the rope or whichever part of the system can be used to absorb the energy that comes from a fall. There is a, there's a mathematical calculation and science behind it, but the concept is uh, energy must be absorbed from a fall. In the event of a fall, there is enough uh, distance available to prevent a person from hitting an object, the ground or any other surface. So the, we call it fall clearance. That means there must be sufficient height uh, for the fall to take place. 
we cannot be saying that if the fall clearance of your system is three meters and you are working at two meters, that will mean that uh, the system you are using will not be effective because uh, yeah, you hit the ground and you still have one meter of slack. That's what it means. Uh. So there must be sufficient fall clearance. We'll come to this later. And it deals with inspection. Where any travel restraint or fall arrest system is to be used in a workplace, it shall be the duty of a responsible person to carry out uh, uh, inspection, sorry, to appoint or carry out, uh, to appoint a competent person to carry out an inspection on the anchorage and anchorage line of the travel restraint system or the fall arrest system. So if you want to use travel restraint system or fall arrest systems, you have to have an equipment inspector that is competent and trained to inspect these systems. So it shall be the duty of the competent person appointed to inspect the anchorage and anchorage line of the travel restraint system at the start of every work shift to ensure that work, good working condition and uh, to immediately remove from service any such uh, anchorage or anchorage line found to be defective to enter the results of such inspection into a register and to provide the register to the responsible person before the end of the work shift. Once again, it's the duty of a responsible person to keep each entry in the registry for not less than two years from the date which it is made and to be able to produce it for inspection upon the request of any inspector. So any responsible person who fails to produce the register shall be guilty of an offense and shall be liable on conviction to a fine not exceeding $2,000. So there, is, uh, there are responsibilities involved uh, in being a PP inspector. It's the duty of the occupier to provide and maintain a substantial handrail or guardrail or any other barrier to prevent a person from falling when you're using a staircase. So especially if the staircase has an open side, it shall be on that side. Or if the staircase has two open sides, it shall be on both sides. Now this is clearly stating that when you walk up a staircase, you need to have guardrails on, on any side that you can fall. So a safe means of access and egress between different working levels of a building or structure is also the duty of, a, of an occupier. He has to take um, reasonable and practicable steps, measures that are necessary to ensure the safe means of access and egress to and from an elevator workplace from which a person could fall, the vicinity of an opening through which a person could fall, the vicinity of an edge where a person could fall, the surface through, which is like a fragile roof, through which a person could fall, or in any other place from which a person could fall. Tegel openings. Now, it is the duty of the occupier to ensure that every Tegel opening or similar doorway used for hoisting or lowering goods or materials in a workplace is either securely fenced, is securely fenced, provided with secure handhold, properly maintained, and kept in position except when goods and materials are being hoisted and lowered at the opening or doorway. So, when the TGO opening is not in use, close it. Wear height regulations on working on roofs. In the workplace, any person who carries out work on any roof from which is liable to fall for a distance of more than two meters, duty of the responsible person to provide protection of a person against any sliding, this includes sliding, uh, or falling from the roof, and sufficient and secure anchorage for the attachment of full body harnesses in the course of a person's work and to ensure that any person who carries out any work on any roof uses the protection and the anchorage. So you have to provide the anchorage, you have to provide the edge protection. You also have to ensure that a person who is working on the roof uses the protection and anchorages provided. So fragile surfaces are surfaces which are fragile like you could fall through. So if a surface which will be liable to fail if uh, reasonably foreseeable loading were to be applied to it. So these types of fragile surfaces when working on, on roofs are things like skylights, corroded roof sheets, fiber cement sheets, linear panels, glass, chipboard, wood tiles, slabs and slates. These are all fragile surfaces. If a person steps on it, see, foreseeable loading, if a person steps on it, it's very likely that the, the surface would fail and a person could fall. So please avoid work, avoid work near fragile roofs and all fragile roofs should be barricaded, covered or protected with a platform as well as a warning notice, perhaps that says danger, fragile roof.
ladders. Ladders are common use access platforms. Huh? Where a ladder is being used to carry out any work at high workplace, shall be the duty of the responsible person to, that is going to carry out the work to ensure that the requirements, these requirements are from paragraphs two to six are complied with. What are they? Every ladder in the workplace shall be good construction, sound material, adequate strength, free from patent defects, suitable and safe for the purpose for which it is intended. Not all ladders are created equal. So use a suitable and safe one. The surface upon which any ladder rests or bears upon when a person shall be, when a person uses a ladder, it shall be stable, level and firm and of sufficient strength to safely support the ladder. And every fixed vertical ladder or user by any person carrying out any work which rises a vertical distance of more than nine meters will require an intermediate landing place. So that the vertical distance between two successive landing places does not exceed nine meters. So it is basically saying that the highest you can climb before you reach a platform should be nine meters. Every landing place here referred to, uh, to uh, shall have sufficient and suitable guardrails and barriers to prevent falls. So you climb up nine meters, you stand onto a working platform, it, you shouldn't be at, uh, uh, exposed to the risk of falls. It should be provided with guardrails and barriers. Okay. Where a fixed vertical ladder is used by any person carrying out work uh, rises more than uh, three meters, a safety cage shall be provided or some other safety measures shall be provided to prevent the fall of a person. Once again, permit to work is required if a person could fall from a height of more than three meters. This comes back to our definition of hazardous work at height. So if a particular task or particular work is considered hazardous work at height, a permit to work system needs to be carried out. What it does mean, like, it means that you need to have an authorized manager, a work height assessor, the supervisor who actually applies for the permit to work, and of course the worker. So that what that what that would mean is that the moment there's hazardous uh, work at height involved, this ecosystem of these four various appointments come into play. That's the main difference between hazardous work at height and work at height. So this permit to work system shall provide uh, there is a okay this permit to work system referred to right shall provide the hazardous work at height is carried out with due regard to the safety and health of the person carrying out the work and that such persons are informed of the hazards and the precautions they should take and the necessary safety precautions are taken and enforced when hazardous work at height is being carried out which is the spirit of why you have this permit to work it is not just a piece of paper it is there to do three things is that yeah, you are informed of the hazards and the precautions that you need to do. Probably your safe work procedure need to be assessed. The assessor has assessed that it is safe for use and the manager has approved that, okay, you can do it. And the supervisor is enforcing the various safe work procedures and the rules and regulations that you have, uh, you have uh, agreed to abide by. In industrial rope access, you know, when industrial rope access system is used, it is the duty of a responsible person to ensure that every anchorage and anchorage line of this system is installed in accordance with the design and drawings of a professional engineer. Now, this is a, a bit different from many other countries. Basically, we are saying that a professional engineer needs to calculate and endorse to say that an anchor is safe for use for rope access. All right. Uh, you need to have at least two independently anchored lifeline, which means that they shouldn't be sharing one anchor. Now, uh, two lifelines is uh, two lines means that one is a working line and the other is a backup line for the fall arrest system. And the lines must not be in contact with anything that could affect the safe use of the system, such as sharp edge line or corrosive liquid. Any person who contravenes this regulation shall be guilty of an offense and shall be liable on conviction to a fine not exceeding $20,000 or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years or both. Well, this refers to an individual. Companies and organizations have responsibilities too. Now, in the application of the permit to work. Now, when the hazardous work at site, uh, hazardous work at height is um, an issue on a site, a permit to work system needs to be needs to be in place. By that, it means that. The worker, supervisor, assessor, and manager forms this ecosystem. As we explained earlier, it is part of our work high competency and legal framework. So there are these uh, six steps. 
in the implementation of a permit to work system. One is application is done by the supervisor. Two is evaluation is done by a uh, work high assessor. Three is uh, the issuance of this uh, permit to work, which is done by an authorized manager, which then leads to the supervisor posting it at the area of work. Meaning any inspector who comes down and see will know that this place, this work is a permit to work type of uh, approved uh, activity. It is subjected to daily review and monitoring. Now that would mean that when a WSH officer, a project manager and inspector comes and he sees 10 pieces of permit to work that's been approved, it would mean that on this site, there are 10 hazardous tasks that needs to be, that attention need to be paid to. So, the supervisor or the foreman of the person who is carrying out this high risk, high risk work is the person who applied the permit to work. He need to state all the work details, the hazards and the measures which are taken to ensure the safety and health of the person carrying out this high risk work. Now the, and, uh, the permit must be addressed to the authorized uh, manager or the ship repair manager and submitted to the safety assessor. So the safety assessor does this thing called evaluation. The job would be to assess whether all these reasonably practical measures have been taken to go and ensure the safety and health of the person who will be carrying out this high-risk work, to inspect the site, including its surroundings, to see that uh, it, is, uh, it is, as we call, as advertised. And it is to be done together with the supervisor or the foreman of the person who's carrying out the work. To endorse the permit to work if satisfied that the high-risk work can be carried out with due regard to the safety and health of the person involved. Uh, with, the, with the safety and health of the person at work and uh, exercise due diligence when performing evaluations and endorsement of this permit to work. Exercising due diligence equals that uh, calling a spade a spade. What is a risk is a risk. What is unacceptable is unacceptable and uh, what is good is good. So an uh, authorized manager will issue the permit to work in relation to this high-risk work. If it's satisfied that you know, the, the proper evaluation of the risk is done, there's no incompatible work being done uh, at the same time because uh, two tasks that are safe by themselves may be incompatible when placed together. Because if I could be working on top and things could drop and you're working below and uh, things could drop on you, even though our individual works are safe in themselves, when you put them together, it is incompatible. That's what incompatible work means. And that all persons who are to carry out this high-risk work are informed of the hazards uh, associated with it. So you shouldn't be sending somebody who doesn't know what's going on to a hazardous work area. Now the posting of this permit to work is done by the supervisor. You clearly post it and ensure that this, uh, this uh, permit to work is not removed until the expiry or the revocation or the completion of this high-risk work. While the work is carrying, uh, being carried out, the work needs to be monitored. So the authorized manager shall continually review the progress of this work. And the supervisor shall ensure that the measures necessary to ensure safety and health of the person at work are taken and are in place at all times during the validity period of the permit to work. And he shall inform the authorized manager once the work is completed. So, where high amendment regulations is uh, applied since uh, 1st May 2014. And it covers every workplace. Let's have a talk of, uh, let's, let's talk about the general provisions in the WSH regulations that deal with where high. 